The North American Society for Oceanic History was created by maritime scholars who met in 1971 at the University of Maine. They recognized that in North America there was no forum for maritime history or a society devoted to the study and promotion of maritime history. The aim of the original group of organizers was to create a diverse organization based initially on Canadian and American membership, which would gain the interest of others. Now there are members worldwide. And it is this diversity of membership that continues to make NASO a truly unique organization. 2020 marked the first year in recent memory that NASO was unable to meet, and therefore we bring historians, archaeologists, and students who are scheduled to present. Welcome to the North American Society for Oceanic History video podcast. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. The goal of the NASO video podcast is to bring you some of the best historians, professionals, archaeologists, and up-and-comers in the field of maritime history. Today, we're heading to the Lone Star State of Texas, being joined by Dr. Rich Hendren. Rich is a 30-year veteran of the U.S. Navy, and particularly the submarine service. Dr. Hendren will be discussing his research into the history and archaeology of the submarine USS H-1. Welcome, Rich, to the NASO video podcast. Thanks a lot, Sal. And, and the doctor part, uh, haven't gotten there yet. Not quite. Yep. Oh, well, I, I, I will, uh, the nasal video, uh, video and podcast can uh, confer honorary degrees, so we will make an honorary one right now, but you're working at it, right, if, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you, Absolutely, yeah, I'm a PhD candidate at uh, Texas A&M University, hence the, uh, the wonderful Aggie colored shirt. That is, that is fine as an ECU grad, I'll keep my mouth shut, we'll just keep trucking right along and, uh, and, and moving on. So, Rich, you're working on the history and archaeology of, of a submarine, the USS H-1. Now, this is a submarine early in American submarine development. We're talking about the period of uh, right around World War I when h one's built prior to World War I, and, and it's lost after H-1. So uh, let me first start with your interest in this topic, a very unique topic, very unique submarine. What sparked your interest in, in the history and archaeology of H-1? Well, having served for, for 30 years, most of it being on submarines or with the submarine force, uh, it's kind of a natural thing, but I actually stumbled on the H-1 in, in talking with one of my colleagues. Uh, he introduced me to the, the fact that we had an American submarine that had been lost off the coast of Mexico in 1920, and it kind of piqued my interest. And uh, I started digging into the history of the boat and, and uh, found a little bit on the, the, the remains and the wrecking site, and, and uh, the rest, so they say, is history. Uh, it, uh, it really got me wound up and, and, uh, and I've been working on this for the last couple of years. So it's a, it's a great talk. Well, it's great. Let's talk a little bit about the, uh, obviously did some background on the H1, obviously not the first submarine the United States has, but submarine development is not new in the history of the United States. So if you want to talk a little bit about that early uh, submarine history, I think that'd be a great kind of primer for, as we talk about H1 herself. Well, it, it really starts long before the United States was even a country. Uh, the first submarine uh, design that we know of was, was drawn by da Vinci. So uh, you're talking the, the Renaissance period. It's in the Codex Atlanticus, uh, where he actually shows a picture of, of what he perceived to be a submersible. And, and in, uh, in his writings, he talks about trying to keep it secret because he didn't trust the nature of man with, uh, with such a, a weapon. Um, and... Uh, we didn't get our first real submersible that was truly functional uh, until the, the uh, American Revolution. And uh, Bushnell's turtle uh, was developed by, by David Bushnell and a, and a team of, of, uh, of very capable artisans. Um, one of the things that you might notice in, in this uh, picture of, of turtle, and this is a, uh, a replica that was built by college, uh, high school students in, uh, in Old Saybrook in Connecticut. Uh, you notice a, a, a screw propeller. And uh, of course that's not supposedly invented until about 80 years afterwards. But in the, the uh, historical descriptions of Turtle, uh, it, was, it was very obvious to me that, that uh, the, uh, the screw propeller was probably indeed invented by, by Bushnell. Uh, the boat was, uh, was pretty small, one man, uh, and it, uh, it was capable of submerging. It just wasn't capable of actively deploying its weapon system, which is the, the, uh, the barrel that you see on the back. The, the idea was to, to uh, run a screw up into the hull of the ship and, 
and then leave them the the uh, the bomb attached. And uh, the operator uh, Ezra Lee, who was a, a an army sergeant actually, struggled with that task and and uh, was not able to pull it off. So Turtle was the first functional submersible that was used in wartime, um, and uh, and really a, a a great stepping stone for other inventors who used pieces of her. Uh, the image you see here is, is uh, of a replica of Robert Fulton's Nautilus. Fulton built this for Napoleon uh, in 1800, and it followed a lot of the principles that, uh, that Bushnell had developed. Um, it was uh, wooden hulled. Um, the, uh, there are people that, that write that say it was, was probably a copper hull, but when uh, when you read Fulton's writings on, on the wrecking of the craft for, for salvage, he doesn't mention any copper being salved. So, you know, thinking that it was a fairly valuable metal at the time, you'd think that, that uh, he would have mentioned that. There's obviously some metal in it, the, uh, the conning tower and, uh, and other bits, but it was predominantly wood. And uh, Fulton introduced us to, to a dual method uh, propulsion. He had a sail for use on the surface, and it was hand cranked uh, by a crew of three uh, when submerged. And it, it submerged successfully. It, it had some fairly good trials, uh, but the, the Achilles heel of all of these hand powered submersibles is they lacked the speed to be able to, to uh, prosecute their opponents. And uh, as soon as they set sail, the, the other guys would lift the anchor and run away. So. Uh, this is the the first artifact that we have of uh, of a human propelled submersible. This is Brontoischer, uh, and Brontoischer is in the uh, Deutsches Museum. And uh, interesting story behind this one: the uh, the inventor Wilhelm Bauer uh, and his crew uh, were the first to survive a sinking of a submersible and escape it at depth. Um, this is a real interesting boat that he kind of, of uh, looked at what a seal looked like and, and tried to develop a submersible around it. The, uh, the large wheels you see in, in center frame there are, are actually hand treadmills um, and there's one on either side. And uh, so two men would actually kind of crawl up over this to, uh, to give it propulsion and it was geared propulsion uh, but again, very slow, and, and uh, there are no uh, diving planes on this vessel. There's no hydroplane at all. Um, and underneath the deck uh, was a sliding weight that they used to alter the fore and aft trim of the vessel to hopefully be able to get it to, to submerge. Well, on the, the first sea trial, um, they used uh, pig iron or, or other weights to, uh, to get it to a near neutral buoyancy with the crew on board. And they were a little bit over. Uh, Bauer figures about 150 uh, pounds. And, and uh, so when they, when they actually got out in the, the, uh, the harbor in Kiel, uh, the boat was heavy by the stern. And as soon as they admitted water into the, the, uh, the section below the floor, there were no sealed ballast tanks. Um, the boat got heavy overall and heavy aft and sank by her stern um, and in so doing impacted the seafloor and these uh, the large hand wheels broke loose, the pumps were ineffective and Bauer somehow coerced his crew into we're just going to sit here and wait until the pressure equalizes, we'll open the hatch and escape and, uh, and that's exactly what happened uh, and he and his, uh, his crew survived. Uh, so interesting boat. He built another one for the Russians that uh, was far more successful, made over 130 dives. It was called Zeitweifel. Um, but uh, it, like this one, ended up on the bottom of the seafloor and Bauer escaped the second time, as did his crew. These are early submarines always sound so dangerous. And the one that comes to mind the most it has to be H.L. Hunley and, and the number of crews that they went through uh, and, and the danger associated with them. Imagine being the last group of guys to get called to be a volunteer on this boat. They called, uh, Hunley started her name, her, her career being called the fish boat. She didn't really have a name. Uh, she didn't have a name until uh, Horace Hunley 
and, uh, and his crew. And this was the second that we know of, possibly the third sinking. Uh, Hunley took the boat out with, uh, with a crew one day. And, and uh, the, uh, the thing about Hunley is she did not have tops on her ballast tanks. And uh, so they freely, there was free communication between the interior of the pressure hull and the ballast tank. And, and what they think happened is uh, when they went to dive the boat, uh, Hunley did not light the candle, which was the normal procedure prior to submerging. And when they, when they submerged, he opened the, the uh, forward uh, ballast tank flood valve and in doing so imparted a downward trim on the boat and lost his wrench to shut that valve. Uh, the boat impacted the bottom. The after ballast tank was pumped dry in, in an effort to, uh, to get the boat back up. The, uh, the Hunley had a, a removable keel, a jettisonable keel, and it was obvious that the men had tried to, to, uh, to detach the keel, but they think that because of the steep angle that she was found at, um, that they simply couldn't mechanically uh, discharge the keel. Uh, Hunley's very unique in that she's the first submersible that we see with uh, the, uh, the large diving fin that's uh, slightly forward of the center of buoyancy. Uh, and this really works well at low speeds. And, and we, we see uh, fore and aft hydroplanes on modern submarines simply because the, the after planes are great at controlling angles at higher speeds. So you're actually using the whole boat as a hydroplane. And at lower speeds, the forward planes impart more lift. So you're actually lifting and driving the boat down. And Hunley is, is one of the first boats that we see this in, uh, and certainly the most effective. But yeah, I, when, uh, when they raised Hunley the, the last time, uh, not the, the, the modern time, but the last time during the Civil War, uh, and raised another crew, I can't imagine the courage that it took for those men to stand up and said, I'll go. Uh, but no. they did. It is, it is amazing. And, and again, I always recommend if you're in the Charleston area to swing by the uh, uh, center there where the Hunley is, is being preserved right now. Amazing. Clive Cussler uh, and, and actually several members of NASA were involved in this and uh, just an amazing piece of technology. But again, I, I couldn't pay me enough to get inside that boat. And, and the Lash Lab is amazing. And, and the, one of the great things that they do is they make Hunley personal. Uh, by there are a couple of mock-ups there that you can actually sit in and, and, and go, oh my God. Oh, the museum it's is way too tall to be trying to hand crank this thing. So museum is fantastic. That mock-up they have, you're right, is, is is claustrophobic, even though it's like it's I think it's a half open vessel. It, it is. It is. And you know the the uh, the boats that were built here in America during that period were really a regression in submarine technology. There was a a, a gentleman in Spain, his name is uh, uh, Montorial and uh, and he built just an amazing boat uh, it was called Ictineo and uh, it's it's uh, only only a holdback was the first one was also human propelled and, and like Hunley and all of her hand crank predecessors was too slow to really get the job done um, but his second boat the Ictineo 2 uh, although it started its life out as being hand propelled uh, was one of the the, uh, the early successful machine propelled or semi-successful. This is a, a picture of her, uh, built of olive wood, um, made you know, many, many dives in her hand cranked uh, model and then uh, made a couple of dives after she'd been, uh, Montreal actually took a, a, a two-part steam engine and, uh, and they took it apart and reassembled it inside the boat. It was too big to go through any of the hatchways. Um, and he came up with a chemical concoction to fire the boiler. So the, the, uh, the boiler was actually fired with a chemical mixture, not coal or, or any other uh, fossil fuel. And uh, so Ictineo 2, when I look at it, it's the first air independent propelled submarine. So actually a submarine and not just a submersible. Unfortunately, the fact that she was built with olive wood about this thick made her superbly in insulated from you know, the, the exchange of heat. 
So the, the inside of the vessel quickly got you know, uninhabitable uh, during submerged operations. And, and she ended up being broken for parts to, to pay debts. But uh, he had uh, atmosphere control systems to, uh, uh, to scrub the air, CO2 scrubbers and oxygen generators. He had a, 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 an external uh, floodlight that was powered by hydrogen that was, was uh, a byproduct of, of uh, his O2 generator system. Uh, just an amazing, amazing submersible. And uh, almost nobody knows about this guy. Uh, and he, he just is, is, uh, was amazing for... So when, uh, when Holland came across from, from Ireland to, to uh, the United States, um, he fell on the ice and, and broke his leg. Uh, and in, in his recuperative time, he drew this little uh, one-man, human-powered submersible. And uh, he tried to sell it to the U.S. Navy, and, and nothing happened. And uh, his brother, Michael, was involved in the Fenian Brotherhood. And, and the Fenian Brotherhood is, is the precursor of, of, uh, of the, uh, or the military arm of the, the American IRA, of the IRA, the Irish Republican Army. And the Fenian Brotherhood was trying to raise money and, and uh, had come up with this idea uh, through talking with Holland that they could build these little submersibles and, uh, and build a specially uh, structured ship that could launch them from uh, beneath the hull and sneak into English ports and, and wreak havoc on, on English shipping. Uh, what well, never came to fruition, but um, Holland did start to design submarines. And uh, after this one, he designed the, uh, the next one, and uh, this one was called the Fenian Ram, and it was the first submersible uh, to use an internal combustion engine. And it used a, a, I believe it was a Brayton. It may have been an auto. It was, it was one of the very early gasoline engines. Um, and it used it both on the surface and submerged. Uh, and it used it submerged by, by using uh, pressurized air to, uh, to feed it. So it, it basically could only submerge as deep as, as the, uh, the differential pressure could be managed between the intake and the exhaust. Uh, so not very successful, but it was the, a paid test platform, if you will. And, uh, and Holland took great advantage of, of having somebody that was willing to pay for him to work out this, this challenge of making a submersible work. Um, this was uh, eventually taken by its, its uh, backers and uh, and run up on the beach in New Jersey. It's currently in a in a museum in, in I believe it's Passaic, New Jersey, and uh, it's it's a a great little submersible, and it it, it worked. It wasn't uh, the uh, the know all and end all, but it got Holland into the business, and uh, the U.S. government was starting to look more at the concept of having submersibles because other people were building them. The French were actively building them, the Spanish were actively building them, um, and America was afraid of getting left in the lurch. And so they you know, solicited a couple of times, um, and Holland won these solicitations uh, twice. And, and there was, unfortunately, nothing ever came as far as a contract until eventually Holland was, was uh, beginning to negotiate with foreign governments to design a submersible. And suddenly money was broken loose and uh, the Navy laid down a set of specifications and Holland built the, uh, the first submersible for the US Navy. Uh, and it was an abject failure. It never made it through sea trials. The Navy wanted something that, uh, that couldn't work. They wanted a, a a submersible that was capable of, of uh, I believe it was 12 or 14 knots on the surface. And at the time, the internal combustion engine wasn't capable of providing that level of propulsive energy. So Holland built this triple screwed monstrosity that was powered by steam on the surface and battery power submerged. Uh, and it, it never worked. Uh, it went out on sea trials, but just completely unsuccessful. And, uh, and Holland knew it was not gonna work, uh, but he was kind of, of uh, 
his hands were tied by the, the build, build spec. So on his own dime, and the, the dime of whoever he could cajole into it, um, he built another submarine, the Holland IV. Um, and it used a gasoline engine on the surface and electric power submerged. And uh, the, the US government would end up buying that. Um, and it became the USS Holland, the first uh, American Navy submarine uh, that was really workable. They had another one back in the Civil War, the Alligator, uh, but it, it didn't do anything other than sink. So uh, Holland was able to build that uh, and, uh, and ended up being the prime contractor for the Navy for submarines for you know, quite a while. This is a really fascinating period for me to study. And, and I, I think, you know, early, early 20th century, late 19th century, we're seeing a, a true revolution in, in naval and maritime affairs. You have the submarine, you have the dreadnought, you have the introduction of aircraft. So things are changing at, 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 at really an amazing level. And then, you know, you have the First World War, which initially starts off very slow for submarines in many ways. But then all of a sudden, you know, we get pulled into it through a series of attacks, through unrestricted submarine warfare, not the first time in 1915, but the second time in 1917. And, and now all of a sudden, the United States finds itself in a war where the, the chief nemesis against us is submarines. I always make this argument in, in, in in the First World War, that you read Wilson's declaration of war speech that he gives, he's not talking about Zimmerman, he's not talking about Mexico, he's talking about submarines, he's talking about what threat they have. And, and it's really amazing. I remember reading a, a, a article by, by uh, Conan Doyle, uh, the, the author of Sherlock Holmes, where he talks about submarines being used pre-World War I to starve out a country like England. And now all of a sudden, here's this asymmetric warfare threat that's being used against merchant marines and navies. Uh, and this is where really the H submarines come in. The United States starts developing a series of submarines, classes, the A's, the B's, goes through all the letters here. And that takes us to really the submarine that you're interested in, which is the H1. So maybe you can take us up to the H class and, and their role. So if, if we look at, at uh, you mentioned the, the, the uh, affairs of World War I, and in one action, uh, a German submarine sank three cruisers. Uh, and, and that was the, the day the light came on in the, the, uh, the concept of submarine warfare. Uh, Abukir, Cressy, and Hogue uh, were sunk over a period of about an hour and a half uh, by a single U-boat. And uh, so the, the, the fact that submarine warfare was here to stay and the fact that there was really nothing that the, the uh, countries that even possessed submarines uh, had done in anti-submarine warfare. Um, you know, we, we had a, a, a weapon that we didn't know how to fight with or against. Uh, so when we, when we look at the H-class boats, um, they're really an amazing little submersible. They, uh, we'd gone from a, a boat that, that could, was barely capable of, of harbor patrol to, to having a, a submarine in the H class that uh, was capable of crossing oceans. The, uh, the first three H boats that were built were built on the west coast of the United States, two of them in San Francisco and one in Seattle. And, uh, and they were a modification of the previous classes. I mean, they're all built on each other. They're all stair steps. Um, but the, the unique thing about the H class boats uh, was their firepower. And this little submarine, uh, carried eight torpedoes, had four torpedo tubes, uh, was diesel electric powered, so they'd gotten away from gasoline and all of the, the hazards that came with that. Interestingly, the, the first diesels that went into these were man diesels designed in Austria and built in New London. Um, and unfortunately, the, our, our ability to build a, a, a great uh, Austrian diesel uh, just wasn't as good as the Austrians. So these, uh, these boats were plagued with. Uh, um, engineering problems from that original diesel. Uh, they were only about 150 feet long and about 15 feet of beam, displaced about 400 tons submerged, um, carried about 6,500 gallons of diesel fuel. Uh, so they were, their ranges were, were not really long, but long enough to, to uh, like I said, get across the Atlantic with a, with a, uh, uh, a tender to, to refuel them. 
the, uh, the first submarines to cross the Atlantic were the H-class submarines that were built in Montreal, Canada by Canadian Vickers for Britain. Uh, and in a deal that was set up by, uh, by Rice, who was one of the principal owners of, uh, of Electric Boat, um, Holland kind of got kicked out after, uh, in, in 1904, he'd sold his patent rights and, and uh, so was, was uh, kind of pushed out of the company. This, this little boat was designed by a gentleman by the name of L.Y. Spear, who had been a naval constructor working with Electric Boat. Uh, some of the, the really great modernizations that you see in the H boats um, are they're compartmentalized. So the, the living conditions were better than they were on the, the early A, Bs, and Cs, where it was a single compartment. Um, the, uh, you had two batteries, a forward battery and an after battery, and that's also where the crew, uh, where the cook cooked and the crew slept. Um, and they slept in pipe and canvas bunks. There was one uh, toilet on the boat. It was located up in the torpedo room. Uh, there was also berthing in there. That was where the officers berthed. Uh, and they actually had a curtain that crossed their bunks, so they had a little bit more privacy. Uh, but there were only three officers on board, typically. And, uh, but they were just a marvel of, of engineering for the time. They were a single hulled vessel, which means that the pressure hull contained everything. There was a casing around it, uh, but modern submersibles uh, have two hulls, an inner and an outer hull. The inner hull is the pressure hull, and it's, it's typically shaped um, to, uh, to maximize the ability to withstand sea pressure. And the outer hull is, gives it its hydrodynamic form. In the, in the vessels like Ictaneo, you notice that they were rounded, as were Holland's early boats, because they wanted this, they stressed underwater hydrodynamic uh, ability. And, and these boats are designed more for as surface vessels that submerge. So the, the, the shape was one that would give them greater surface speed while still being able to, to, uh, to operate submerged. So truly a compromise. Uh, Rich, if I, I go back for one second, if you don't mind, I, I think your your point about electric boat was a really interesting one because these boats, as you mentioned, they're, they're, some of them were being built in, in uh, excuse me, in Canada for the British. Some were being built for the Russians too. And so, I mean, so the British and Russians are using boats like these. And, and so you would have to think that the H-class is in a very informative design in future development of submarines in not just our country, but in these other countries too. It is, absolutely. And, and because of it, it's... Uh, uh, popularity and, and there were 75 of these boats and their variants made. Uh, the, the Brits came up with a, a, a second version it was called the H21s and, uh, and they actually used a 21 inch diameter torpedo tube instead of the 18 because it, by the, the time World War I was, was wrapping up they were understanding very quickly that the, the, uh, the smaller torpedo lacked the punch to to sink big capital ships. So the, the, uh, the British designed this in a slightly larger variant uh, with the 21 inch tube. These boats actually operated some of them until the late 1950s. So the, 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 some of the boats that were designed for, uh, for Russia that were built in Vancouver um, ended up in boxes. When, the, when Tsarist Russia fell, the export of these vessels stopped. And uh, they'd already been built, broken down, crated up, and, and were sitting in Canada until we bought them uh, from the Canadians and assembled them in Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. Uh, they never really did anything after that, but some of those vessels, uh, the later ones, uh, survived until the 30s. And a couple of the boats that were built on the East Coast were uh, uh, given to Chile. Um, because we, there were uh, boats, that, ships that the British took that they were building for Chile uh, and turned them around for their own use because they were already engaged with Germany uh, and basically took them away from Germany. So in, in, uh, in repayment, they gave them some of these H-class submarines and they operated there until the 50s. So it's amazing how good they were. The, the officers that operated them loved them uh, and took them over some of the, the, the later class vessels uh, they called them handy and and uh, and you know with high firepower. So they they liked that they were maneuverable and small, 
very great. And it was designed as a coastal defense submarine and it really fit the bill. H1, H2, and, and her sister H3, I know we're on the West Coast. They come over to the East Coast during the World War. They operate out of, I think, Long Island Sound, New London area. Mm -hmm. Some American submarines are sent overseas, some to the Azores, some to operate out of Ireland, out, out of Bantry Bay. And one of the interesting things about these early submarines the U.S. are using is they're using them in patrol methods. It's almost as anti-submarine warfare, actually jumping a generation, actually uh, beyond what we do in World War II, but actually go what we do in the Cold War and use them as as, as patrol vessels against them. Uh, obviously, H-1 is, is important for us here because H-1 is eventually lost, and, and that's a, a major component of your research. So I thought we'd talk about that element of, of, of discovery of H-1, the finding of H-1, and, and why H-1 is then so significant to the development of, of future research into early American submarine development. Certainly. Um, the, at the end of the war, the, the, uh, the H boats found themselves in the shipyard in Philadelphia, getting repowered, new periscopes, uh, some modernization. And, uh, and after that was completed, uh, H1 and H2 uh, started their passage back around to, to, uh, to get back to the West Coast and uh, pretty much retracing their steps from whence they came. And, uh, and after transiting the Panama Canal, H1, H2, and the, the, uh, the support vessel Eagle 11 were, were transiting up the, the uh, west coast of Mexico, and uh, they'd been having some mechanical difficulties. The, the uh, uh, Eagle 11 was a steam-powered vessel, and, and she'd been having problems making water, uh, was short on water, and, and was lagging behind the two subs. Uh, and the, the boats were ex experiencing, experiencing some mechanical difficulties. So they decided to pull into Bahia uh, Magdalena, Magdalena Bay. Uh, and if you look at the, the, uh, the map here, we're really just coming up the, the coast of Baja California. And, uh, and north of La Paz on the western side is this beautiful bay that's been used by uh, everybody. Uh, for years, and, and it's a, a, a very, very safe bay. Um, can you give me the next slide? It kind of gives us a blow up of the, the bay itself. So if you, if you look at the bay, the, the goal was to, uh, to come up and make the northern entrance up here. And uh, this bay has been used as a coaling facility, uh, a, a turtle hunting area. It was a very rich area for turtles. Uh, and turtles, of course, were one of the primary food stocks of the early, early mariner. Uh, also a whaling area. There's a great gray whale breeding population that's in there now. And, and now the, a lot of the, uh, uh, the tourist dollars that support the local communities of San Carlos up here uh, and Puerto Alcatraz, the, the small community down here, um, are based in, in tourism. Um, so H1 and H2 are, are uh, navigating at night. And of course, the navigation then was, was uh, by guess and by God uh, and, and coastal navigation. And uh, if you look at where H1's wreck site is, uh, you'll notice that there's a broad, flat expanse of sand. And uh, the, uh, the area in the early uh, pilot charts uh, is called False Bay. And uh, they were, they were sure that they were headed into the, the northern inlet there of, uh, of Bahia de Magdalena. And uh, in fact, they were headed into False Bay. The captain, who was a, a lieutenant commander, uh, had never been here before, as far as I know. I've not found anything that says that he had any early local knowledge. Uh, Jim Webb was his name. And he called for the chief of the boat to come up and take manual soundings. And so the, the chief of the boat, uh, Chief Albrecht, was, was on the bow casting a lead, just as mariners had done for forever. And when they, when they, were, uh, they were seven fathoms and, and no bottom, uh, he sent the chief down for a cup of coffee. He was sure he was in the harbor. And uh, as soon as the chief got below and got a cup in his hand, the boat ran aground. And it was a nasty night. The, the, uh, the weather was, was not good. There was a pretty heavy swell running from, uh, from west to east. 
and uh, the little submarine was pretty much rolled over on her side and Webb was lost shortly thereafter. Uh, he was last seen in the surf and, and, uh, and he died that night, um, as did three others. The, uh, the submarine washed up on the beach and uh, there were a couple of destroyers in the local vicinity and they tried to get a line on her. Uh, interestingly, while she was uh, uh, ashore, she was boarded and, uh, and very thoroughly ransacked. Her safe was broken into, her code books were stolen, all of her small arms were stolen, uh, and some of the things like logbooks were just strewn. Uh, her sextant ended up on a, a, a merchant ship, and uh, we've been able to trace that back to, to, uh, to the bay. But uh, she also had a big fire on board. Um, I believe that her, her batteries overgassed, uh, got seawater in there, and, and uh, shorted, caught fire, and, uh, and basically burned out a, a great deal of the boat. So she was pretty much a wreck, and, and the Navy sent a salvage team down from San Diego, uh, and they were in the process of pulling her back into deep water uh, when another storm came up and she started beating real heavily on a sandbar. Um, I believe that that probably either opened a seam, she had a riveted hull, uh, either opened a seam or, or uh, opened something in her stern gear. And uh, as soon as they made the decision that they had to pull her off or definitely lose her, they got her into deeper water. She sunk by the stern and, and remains in that spot today. Um, so she went kind of unmolested other than, than uh, uh, probably a little bit of local interference for salvage over the years. Her, her salvage rights were sold, but the salver failed to produce and the, the, uh, have not been able to find the actual document of sale but if it's consistent with the rest of the salvage documents at the time, uh, her ownership would have reverted back to the Navy. So she's among the list of, of, uh, of sunken naval vessels. Uh, so protected by the, the Sunken Naval Craft Act and also protected uh, by the, the uh, uh, Cultural Patrimony Acts of, of the government of Mexico. So her wreck is, is uh, in about that location. Uh, in about 60 feet of water and uh, is, is just a wonderful uh, piece of, of, of history. These are some of the pieces that have been removed by, uh, by local salvers. Uh, we've been able to recover, uh, thanks to their kindness, a, a piece of the periscope, the actual per, uh, periscope head window. Uh, we're in the process of uh, repatriating the clock Part of, of what my group is, this is, this is Factor Verde, uh, the, a group of, of Mexican adventurers and amateur archaeologists uh, that are very interested in, uh, in preserving the cultural heritage of the area. Um, a couple of, of uh, fellow archaeologists from uh, University of Indiana and from the Institute of, uh, of Archaeology and History of Mexico. Uh, are participating with this group with me and and, uh, and the rest of the crew there. And uh, we went down and, and uh, actually had the opportunity to dive on the boat. Uh, this is us getting ready to, to uh, go out there. It's very remote uh, and the village is very small. And, and one of the things that we were quite concerned about is not having any negative impact. So one of the ways we thought we could have some positive impact was buying plenty of extra food and making sure that a lot of that was uh, uh, non-perishable, uh, which we left with the, the local villagers to kind of help out a little bit. Wonderfully hosted by a, 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 a very small town. Uh, this is the way out there. Uh, it's a long stretch of, of sand and uh, you can see the island a little bit to the, the right hand of the road there and uh, the road actually does terminate in the water and uh, from there we loaded all of our uh, material on Topangas and, uh, and transited out. This is the, looking down on the village of Puerto Alcatraz, uh, which is a, a real small fishing village. All of their income comes from the sea and uh, wonderful hospitable people. And, and uh, they were very, very, very great hosts and we sure appreciated them. These are the Pangas. These are, these are designed in Japan, actually. These are uh, Yamaha design. 
and uh, that design has somehow made it to Mexico and, and is used ubiquitously up and down the coast and a great little sea boat. Uh, we loaded up that morning and, and, uh, and headed out and, and as a submariner going through my mind the whole time was, you know, look at this bay and everything else. How in the world could a, a, a submarine CO uh, be lured into, you know, wrecking his boat here? And as we, we made our way around the point and, and I saw the, uh, the area of the wreck, it was clear to me what had happened. You know, it was so obvious that that, that really low dished out sand area looked just like the, the entrance to a bay. And, and uh, so all I could feel was sympathy for Commander Webb and the, the other three men that were lost and the guys that survived. I mean, it was quite a struggle for them. Uh, a lot of injuries and they wandered around on, on uh, the island basically naked and scared. I'm sure the, the sun was, this is not a hospitable place. Uh, they were finally picked up by a steamer and, uh, and transported back up to San Francisco. This is a- uh, Rick, before we get, uh, jump in this, I just wanna take a step back for, for just one second, Rich. So the H1 runs aground and like you said, I, I can completely understand the false bay concept. I mean, the, the illusion of, of, of a bay is very, pronounced at points and, and without good navigation, without, you know, modern day satellite navigation or, or aids to navigation of any kind, it's it very easy to get kind of get yourself confused. This is a period of time when the Navy is suffering groundings, you know, quite frequently. Yeah. I mean, and not just the U.S. Navy, but all navies are losing ships to Milwaukee, the, the, the uh, I'm thinking of a whole batch of ships that, that, that are this, you know, a few years after this, the U.S. Navy loses seven destroyers up at Honda Point. Uh, and so this is a, a fairly frequent occurrence right here. Now the H1 is, is beached, but she's pulled off and then eventually I think sinks out further off the coast. I think the vessel comes in and, and, and yanks her off, but she is not able to stay afloat and, and she goes down. Was she lost? I, I mean, did people not know about her being in there at that position? And did, did, was her position uh, lost to history there for a brief period of time? Yeah, I think so. Um... I mean, it, the, when they, the Navy washed their hands of her, they sold the salvage rights. So it, she, she went from being a, a, a vessel on the Naval Register to, you know, somebody else's problem. And I think during that period, while the, the salver was basically, as far as I can see, he did nothing um, to, to try to get her up. Um, or if he did, there's, there's very little record or no record of it that I've found. Um, and I think that after that, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. And this one little you know, 150 foot boat is, is, uh, is nothing but a tiny blip on nobody's radar. I think she was. Other than the, I, the local, local fishermen probably knew about it based on the fact that, that you know, pieces, parts have been removed. Um, and, and any obstruction like that instantly becomes a place where fish congregate. And when you, when you look at the, the wreck, you can see you know, there's fish all over it, there's marine life all over the place. Uh, and the, the way that it came back to, to general knowledge was the, the fishermen kept losing their, their, uh, uh, their lobster traps. And uh, one of them dove over and found it. And, and uh, there was a, an underwater photographer that was very interested. Martinez is his name, Alfredo Martinez. And, uh, and he's credited with finding her wreck again. Uh, and uh, and doing some of the first photography and dives on her so uh, yeah i think she was pretty much lost other than to the locals for probably you know 50 60 years we interrupt rich's talk to bring you a brief commentary from john green of crash course but even cooler discoveries have been made by underwater archaeologists wait a second stan are there really underwater archaeologists there are where were those people on career day oh they were probably underwater so one of my favorite topics to talk about is, is having gone through a master's program at East Carolina in nautical archaeology is how historians can use archaeology in, in propelling history forward. You know, one of the big chasms I think that have existed for a long time is between archaeologists and his, historians in many ways. Archaeologists love to find things. They love to document it. And then it doesn't go any further, whereas historians love to get a dusty old primary source off a shelf or out of an archive. But yet here's the, you know, a vestige of that period of time preserved, a time capsule in history, and it's not being used. What, what does the H1 allow us to do as, as historians in understanding this period of time? What does that wreck really present to us? 
Well, it, it's, it's interesting because we, as, as uh, underwater archaeologists, kind of straddle that chasm of, of history versus artifact. And uh, it, when, you, when you look at what can you learn from this boat that's not in a history book, uh, it's, it's one of the, the most telling things that I can offer is, is uh, we found this amazing little drawer pull. Uh, we were on a, a, a visual only permit. So basically we're, we're operating under the, the Sunken Military Craft Act. You can look, but you cannot touch. Uh, so it's still down there, but there was this beautiful little China door pull uh, that's part of the wreck. And, uh, and, and you won't find that in any history book. You know, the fact that, that these guys made this place their home. Um, and I don't know whether it was a piece of original equipment. You know, we're never going to find that on an equipment list. So the, the, the pieces like that, the, the, uh, the artifacts of um, the people that, that actually lived on this vessel, uh, and they, they've been pretty well picked clean in this case. You, we're not finding or didn't see, we're, you know, because we're not excavating. Uh, we didn't see a lot of things like that just on the surface of the wreck, but the, it, it allows us to span that gap between what's in the book and what the wreck tells us about what was the, the, uh, the worst day in these sailors' lives and the last day in some of their lives. Um, and, and because we, we don't see the, the wreck of H1 um, up on the beach, you know, it's not perfectly recreated, but... Uh, in shipwrecks in general, that's what we get to see is this snapshot of the worst day of a mariner's life. Um, Rich, your background is in submarines. You, you enlisted in the Navy as, a, as, as an enlisted sailor. You worked your way up through chief and then became an officer, retired as a, as a commander. What is the H-1, you know, what legacies do you see from H-1 that carried over into the modern day Navy that you served in? Oh, gosh. Um, well, the... the the brotherhood of, of, we call it the brotherhood of the fin, uh, the wearers of dolphins, all of us that are qualified in submarines, anytime we see something like this, uh, you know, the thing that goes through your mind is there, but for the grace of God, go I. Uh, because uh, a submarine wreck, you know, is, it, is, it gives you your own mortality. I mean, this, four guys died here. Um, you know, doing the things that I did for, you know, 30 years. Um, and I've lived through casualties at sea and, and had bad things happen. And, you know, because of our training and the, the improvements in, in submarines, uh, you know, it didn't kill us. Uh, but there's a lot of guys that it did. Um, so this is, to me, uh, this is a memorial site. You know, this is a, you know, a gravestone for all the guys that, that uh, are still on eternal patrol. Uh, so it's very uh, uh, emotional for me as as a as a submariner, and and very uh, I feel very privileged to be able to study it and to be able to dive on it and and uh, to be able to pay my respects there. I think this submarine, in particular, the H one, really sets the tone for what eventually becomes probably one of the most successful submarine campaigns in all of history, which is the American submarine campaign against Japan in World War Two. And and you can really see at the beginning here of, of, of that development with submarines like the H one, where you're getting the the basis for what becomes a successful Gato and 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 and, and uh, uh, Tench class of submarines, Baleo class that, that that fight World War Two, and and even up into the modern day. I mean, even up into our, our nuclear submarines today, you start seeing that that transition point. And I think submarines like this really capture this. This is the the dive we did, and you can tell this is kind of sped up a little bit just because we're, we're in the descent phase. Our first dive, we didn't find anything, uh, very disappointing. Uh, we found a lot of sand, uh, but on our second dive, we were able to, to locate the boat. Uh, and you'll see throughout this, the, uh, the amazing amount of marine life that, uh, that is present down here. The boat is, is uh, she may be dead herself, but the, the reef that she's created is, uh, is just amazing. And there's uh, moray eels and octopus and, you know, fish of every description, these beautiful fan corals that you see um, and, and the boat itself. And, and uh, you can see control rods here 
leading back to the stern planes and the rudder. Her screws are still there. Um, and this, this nice thick coating of, of uh, incrustation uh, that's, that's preserving what's left of her. She's in a pretty active hydrodynamic zone. Uh, even in 60 feet of water, it moves around quite a bit. What you're seeing here is, is parts of the engine room uh, and the, the engine room machinery. That's a generator set. Um, we'll come up on the, the main engine here. That's the generator there that you're seeing in the armature. One of the many, many lobster pots. Part of our, we've got a trip going back down next October, this coming October, we hope. And, and uh, one of our goals is to remove all of the, the uh, infill there all the lobster traps and stuff like that um rich were you able to determine were you able to see any of the physical damage i know i think she's laying on her port side were you able to see any of the damage caused by the grounding on her bottom at all or no, at this point no it's i mean it's so covered by encrustation uh and it's it's we can tell that there have been plates that have been stripped away uh, so no you can't see any of the actual damage um, that's her conning tower, part of her conning tower there. Uh, there are still four torpedoes on board, four 18-inch uh, Bliss Levitt Mark 7s. Uh, we believe that are armed with exploders. So you can see when we get up to the fore end here, um, the torpedo tubes are still there. That's the torpedo loading hatch that's been torn away. And this is done with a helmet mounted camera. So it's, it's kind of jerky. Every time I turn my head, you get to see whatever I'm looking at. You get really good visibility, but yeah. This type of uh, underwater research that you do. And again, you know, there's a couple of schools in, in the United States that do this really well, you know, Texas A&M, East Carolina, uh, West Florida, and, and there's many others that have uh, archeology span departments that, that do this. I, I think one of the big things that we're seeing now is, is how we can capture, you know, mosaics of this with with sound uh, sonar devices and really picture you know really you know capture that image of, of what a wreck looks like undersea you know back when i started doing this back in the 90s you were really limited you know to what was right in front of you and then having the mosaic together but now we get much better pictures much better imagery than before and, and again i I'll go back to this, Rich. What do you want this information to to go toward? You know, what, what's what's the what's the end site you see? You know, one of the things that I think is we don't understand a lot of the pre World War II submarine force and how the U.S. submarines developed during those those years leading up to it. And you know, I I think we don't look at World War One enough to understand our successes in World War II. So I'm interested in your viewpoint on that. Well, the, one of the one of the big reasons this is so attractive to me is it's a gap. Um, and, and you're exactly right. We don't know much. The, the, the story's out there. It's just not told very well of, of what it was like from the, the A-class um, to the H-class boats. You know, the, the, uh, and, and I want to tell the story of that development to an extent, um, but really just to, to be able to highlight the fact that these boats existed. Here's where you can go read about it. Uh, and then look at the H classes as it is really, you know, when you think about it, it it's the baby Tench class. Uh, it's the baby Baleo. And, uh, and from this point, you know, we make an awful lot of, of, uh, of forward motion, uh, but we're almost there. And, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that we had a huge depression in between the wars and it probably stifled some of the, the uh, ability to grow in, in the development of submersibles. Uh, but it's, it's just amazing how far we got in, in the, the, the years from 1900 to 1910 when, uh, when the H-boats were, were, uh, were programmed and, and uh, when they finally came out, they were you know, absolutely top of the line boats. And being able to tell that story, being able to, to uh, one, uh, the, one of the, the primary reasons that be telling this story, not just here, but in Mexico is important, is, is right now the, the biggest value of, of this shipwreck um, to the local folks is for salvage, for parts. Um, to be able to find a piece of brass or, or have something to, 
you know, tell a story with. And, and one of our goals in Factor Verde is to, to uh, actually get a small museum started there on the island to see if we can make the, the cultural history more valuable than the, the wreck itself to them. Uh, so being able to tell that story both here in Mexico um, is important to me. And, and also telling the story of the, the men that were on it and what it was like to live on that boat. I, I think that's such an admirable goal because I think it's so important. We're seeing wrecks disappear and not due to natural causes, but being salvaged. I'm thinking of, of uh, Navy ships that were sunk in the Java Sea and in Indonesia. Uh, a lot of wrecks, you know, these, these are, are memorials to the crews that served on board. Some of them are tombs to them. And yet we're seeing them scrapped uh, or salvaged for their parts. Uh, and, and, you know, there's always been that issue with, with sports divers taking elements off a wreck. But I think you're right. I, I think when you have something like this and with the technology that exists today where we can put UAVs in the water, have live feeds from underwater so that, you know, you can have online demonstrations of, of wrecks and see them. I think that's such an important part of using the maritime environment to, to teach about the history. And I, I think, you know, finding wrecks like these and, and more importantly, documenting them and, and, and cataloging them and making them available to every day. So you don't have to jump in the water. You don't have to be a certified diver and go down in 60 feet of water, but you can get this type of, of video, this type of environment and, and understand that. I think it's so important to do. Uh, Rich, what's, what's up next for you? What's the, uh, what do you got coming up? Uh, obviously next, obviously finishing the PhD is going to be the big one. <laughs> Yeah, my my uh, my life is being sucked up by a dissertation. Uh, actually, we're we're uh, we're planning another trip back down to to Isla Margarita. Uh, there's another wreck that uh, that Factor Verde and uh, the uh, and Ina, the the Mexican um, underwater archaeological group, is very interested in finding. It's the uh, SS Independence. Um, it was a uh, a steamer that sank during the gold rush era with a loss of, of like 134 lives. Um, and she's, uh, she's been lost. You know, we, they don't know where she is. We think we've got a pretty good idea, uh, but we want to go find her. And I want to go back down to H1. Uh, I want to be able to uh, put a plaque there. The, the marine preserve concept seems to be pretty effective in other areas where just a simple placard um, posted on the wreck uh, tends to dissuade people from, from uh, at least the honest ones, from taking pieces parts. Uh, we want to work with the local community down there and see if we can get our little museum going. And uh, the, uh, the Periscope uh, headpiece that we've got, there are a few other pieces that uh, the locals have turned over to us uh, that we want to, to uh, set up. We're gonna build a, uh, a a visual display, uh, mostly of, of uh, underwater pictures, and the I've got the plans for the boat that I've blown up, and we'll make a, a nice display out of those. So we really tr want to try to make this, like I said, more value to the local community as a um, a piece of cultural heritage than she is a scrap, and uh, and see if we can't get some interest in the local diving community and supporting ongoing videos and, and things like that to try to tell the story. Uh, and eventually there may be a book in this. Um, I, I liked the idea of being able to tell that story in a, in a more publicly digestible format than a dissertation. Um, so we'll see. Well, I think it's a great note to end this on. I, I want to thank our guest, uh, uh, Rich Hendren, a uh, future doctor, uh, working on uh, the H1 uh, down there at Texas. Uh, I, I want to thank you for, for being on board uh, with the uh, NASO video and podcast. Uh, we always remind the people that we will have links into our show notes for everything that Rich cited there and mentioned. We'll always uh, have links over to what is available about H1 for you to see. Uh, one of the things we recommend is if you enjoy this video and you enjoy this podcast, subscribe to our video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, make sure you click five stars on your podcast provider. Uh, and the best way to really find out more about NASO is to become a member of NASO. Uh, you can follow NASO on Twitter at, at NASO underscore history, or better yet, you can go to www.naso.org, click on membership and become a member of NASO. Uh, becoming a member of NASO gets you, our core, uh, gets you our newsletter, gets you our quarterly journal, The Northern Mariner, which we do in concert with the Canadian Nautical Research Society. And most importantly, keep you abreast of everything that's going on with NASO and 
including our future conference we hope to have in the spring of 2021 back down in Pensacola. Once again, thanks, Rich. I appreciate for you being on. And to our, all our listeners and all our viewers, keep sailing. It was a real pleasure. And, and uh, if you want to learn more about early submersibles, there's a great website. It's called pigboats.com. Um, and uh, Rick Hedman, who keeps that up, does a wonderful job and uh, a great resource if you want to learn a little bit more. Thank you, Rich. I appreciate it. And like I said, we'll see you soon. Bye. Cheers.